finish the whole feed in the whole prison. And then he calls me, Paul, come here. Put your hands behind your back. I'm like, what? You could have did that two hours. Like, after I done fed, cleaned the whole kitchen for the whole prison, now you going to lock me up? I went all the way bananas. They didn't hit the beeper on me. They grabbed me. They, they had to uh, cuff me, fully restrain me. I, I'm tussing with all of them, hit one of them against the wall. So now I'm down. So now when I'm down and I'm coming, they bringing me out. They, the 1019 cell block traffic, they shut the walk down. So when they shut the walk down, I realized he's one of the ones cuffing me. So then I run him. They had pillars in the middle of the walk. I run him into the thing he runs into the thing because he's holding me so I went to the side he runs into the thing next thing you know they hit the beeper on me again now they pick me up in the air and I'm like flying to the cell block and then I get behind the other door and the lieutenant they was all waiting for me out there I remember I thought they was gonna kill me On today's show, we have Andy Pellerano here to share how he ended up joining the Latin Kings and ultimately got sentenced to prison. This is an exciting perspective from a former Latin King, and we're so excited to dive into this episode with him today. Let's not waste any time getting into this exciting episode and sit back, relax, and get ready to lock in with Andy Pellerano. Andy, welcome to Locked In, man. Pleasure having you uh, today. You reached out, uh, I think, on my Instagram, right? Uh, like a month or so ago. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you were featured in, the, what was it, Inside True Crime or How Crime Works? Yep. Um, by Insider, I think. Yep. I was watching their episode on YouTube. It's got a lot of views on it. Oh, yeah. I think it's like, it's over 350,000. It's been like three weeks. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. How does that make you feel, seeing all those views? Well, you know it, it's it's kind of mixed because it's like I, I would have rather like the entire content went out, like especially like a lot of the questions I answered. I I would actually I didn't just answer the question. I went in depth and try to just not leave people there. Like I'll actually like teach something in it, you know, where I'm not just there sharing a war story. Like I, I went to give the Lord glory. But at the end, you know, it did talk about my transformation. You know, they do have my links on there. You know, I was able to reach out to people like I reached out to you and it's opened a lot more doors. So I, I, I thank I thank them for supplying the avenue for me to go out there and share, you know, so we can't never be like, I wanted it to be like this. I'm not the director. It's not my show. No, no. You know, so it, it was good though. You know, I think I think uh, I think it, it, it's been good. Well, hopefully, this opens up more avenues for you too. And this is more like to my podcast, but you're the director of it because you get to drive. You're in the driver's seat. Okay, okay. I just I like to have my guests come on and you know share their story the way they want to. And right. like we were talking about earlier, it's an unedited version of your story. Um, and it's also exciting. I think you are our first Latin king on the show, too. Okay. I don't think we've ever had one on before. I think we had people that had relatives on that. So it'll be interesting to to get into that, too. Um, well, I'm not a Latin king no more. No, not anymore. A former Latin <laughs> I'm king. I'm a priest king now. Yeah, of but no, course. I know yeah. what you're saying. Yeah, I know yeah, what you're yeah saying. of course not. Most people aren't active uh, yeah, that yeah. come on the show. But um, that was their main hook of, of, of the episode that you did for, right. for Inside. Right. That, and it was interesting to see that. Because you don't really get to see that, like, from someone that's renounced it and is not a part of that life anymore. Right. Um, but, yeah, so where are you from? Where did you grow up? Where, where were you born? West Bank, New Orleans. New Orleans. Yeah. Uh, I think we've had a couple of New Orleans people on the show. I've never been to New Orleans. Oh, you got to come. Yeah, I got to get some food there, well, that, too. <laughs> they definitely got to get some food. I, I tell my people all the time, we got the best food in the world. Really? Yeah, like, for real. I got to check that out. Yeah. What, what was it like to grow up there? It was, you know, well, you know, growing up, you really don't know different, you know, because this is just, this is your environment, and you think this is what it is, but... You know, it was, it was, it, it was interesting, especially like doing time and getting to travel the nation. Like New Orleans is really like a gumbo pot of culture, of ethnicities. You know, like it's all mixed up over there. So you really don't get like when you travel to other places, especially like in prison too. Like when you get to Texas and other prisons, like in Florida, like usually your race hangs with your race. But like in Louisiana prisons in New Orleans, it's it's where you from. You know, so that's gonna be a dem That's gonna be all all kinds of different ethnicities that's riding together. But, you know, it's a lot of culture in New Orleans. You know, they always, you know, I one thing, I thought everywhere in the world, 
clubs was open 24-7. I thought you could buy liquor 24 anywhere in the world. I remember first going to, when I first started going to Houston, and it was like, oh, well, can you get some liquor? I'm like, yeah. So we we went to the store, and it was like, it's a dry county. They don't sell liquor on these days or past this time. I'm like, what is this? <laughs> We go to the club and they shutting it down like at 2 a.m. or 3 a.m. I'm like, what? Is, I'm used to the lights coming, like you coming outside feeling like a vampire because the sun's out. So I didn't know this was not normal. You know what I'm saying? So coming up in New Orleans, in just that culture and just just the streets, it, it was it was a lot going on. But now. I see everything happens for a reason. I know I was geographically, strategically placed right there generationally for such a time as this, because even with the mixture of cultures, I'm able to travel around the, around the, the nation, you know what I'm saying, and and not really feel like an outcast, if that makes sense. Yeah, in Connecticut, the, the liquor shuts off at 2, 2 a.m., See? Yeah, and uh, they can't sell liquor after, I think, like, 6 on Sundays in, in liquor But that's liquor a good stores. thing now, I see. <laughs> but, I was like, when I was coming up, I just thought everywhere it was just, it was normal, you know. But understanding not, it's not normal, you know. So, and all of that shaped and molded the man I am today. So, I have no regrets of where I'm from because I know that's where God called me to be. Did you have a big family growing up, siblings, mom, dad? Well, my mom, my dad, I, and I had a sister, but I had a lot of cousins, you know. So I, at one point, I remember it was me, my sister, my cousin, his sister, my grandma, my mom and dad all living in the same three-bedroom house, you know, at one time. But, uh, you know, my, 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 my dad, he always, like, would throw the parties and stuff, you know, so we, we always had a lot of family around. I remember a lot of get-togethers, a lot of barbecues, you know, so. And then they had a lot of people, like, in my neighborhood, a lot of friends, and I was, like, I was one of the youngest ones, you know, so I was always outside, always getting into stuff, you know, so. Yeah, you know, I, I grew up around a lot of family. Even when we was on Bienville and Carrollton, you know, by the pink house, I had my uncles and my grandpa and my cousins and my aunties and all of that. So I, I know how to grow up around a community. Was it a good home? Like, did you guys have money? Were you guys poor, struggling? Well, one thing, my dad, my dad is... He's a hustler. He's a go-getter. Like, he always, he was always doing something. Like, he had a nightclub at one time. He was the DJ at the nightclub. Then he ended up selling it because my mom was, like, ready to leave him behind the club. So then he chose his family. But it was right at the right time because a little bit after that, the, the guy that he owned the club with ended up getting busted and ended up getting, like, I think 10 years or something. So then he went from there to working in the oil field. So then he was always offshore. And then, then he I remember he had another bar and a restaurant. And then there was the mechanic shop. Then he was trying to do sell tires, you know. So he was always doing something. And my mama, she always worked. She started as a teller in the bank. And worked her way all the way up to a regional manager, you know, so they were always working, you know, but one thing they did, like, we didn't have a lot, but one thing they, they made sure that we had a good education, like they paid for a Catholic school education. And I, you know, I, I, even to this day, I'm like, y'all didn't waste that, you know what I'm saying? Because I'm using it now, but they always was working. So by them always being always working and my sister kind of like watching all of us, I was just outside in the streets. And then there was just a lot of influences around me that was, you know, in the streets, like that was older than me. They were, you know, selling guns, selling drugs, doing drugs, robbing people. And just even in the core of my friends growing up, like one of them, he got murdered. He did it. He, he went to kick somebody's door in. Nephew left him. He got murdered right there on the spot. Another one got murdered, got stabbed, shot in the head and set on fire. Another one overdosed on drugs. The other one, he got deported. So this is like, these were like my friends, like close growing up and like nobody's really here no more. Yeah. How was the area? Was it like crime infested? Was it a safe spot? It was like we was doing all the crime. You guys were doing all yeah, the crime, even was, at a young age. At, at a young age, I, I, I was I was twelve, thirteen when I caught my first felony. So where do you think that came from? Because you had a hard, two hardworking parents, yeah, um, that were raising you right, trying to raise you right, right. Do you remember like that first moment where, you know, you kind of strayed outside of that? 
Yeah, I I, I do because because it, it was it was it was one thing. It was the movies, Hollywood, and it was the it, it was the music industry, and then it was the influences that I had that were older than me that I was gravitating to. You know, because my dad was always at work, so this was the older male figures in my life, and they was they was they was gangster. You know what I'm saying? So then it's to being the youngest one, so feeling like I had to prove myself, like I was just as bad, and then like my uncles and all of them, all of them was tough guys. You know what I'm saying? Like they all like the alpha males. You know, so I'm thinking like. I gotta be. I want to be the baddest one. Like my dad, he got he got shot in the leg twice and uh, got a steel plate in his head. From police cracked him in his cracked his skull. My mom got shot in the butt. You know, shot so, in the butt. Shot in the butt. The same <laughs> incident. The dude pulled out a gun and my dad tries to like wrestle the dude down when the dude got a gun and he got two shots off. Shot my dad twice in the thigh and then by that time my dad got to him and then another bullet ricocheted and hit my mom in the butt. What was that a robbery or something? No, no it was a, it was a party. I think it was the DJ and he wasn't getting paid or something and he was drunk so he started acting crazy and then my dad just think he's Superman. Yeah. <laughs> he went to go try to try to try to get him and so but hearing these stories, you know, like my dad wasn't soft. None of none of my uncles, like they were all rough. So hearing these stories, I'm like, man, I want to be, I want to be the worst one, you know. But not only that, watching these movies, like I'm watching Scarface, I'm watching, I'm watching American Me, Blood in Blood Out, at a young age, and see these are eye gates and these are ear gates. What you allow into your eye gates got the potential to defile you interior internally, defile your temple or construct your temple. So when I'm looking at this I'm like Scarface got the girls got this the world is mine and I'm like man I want that you know and then I'm listening to the gangster music and they nothing doing nothing but degrading women selling drugs killing people so I'm thinking if, if this is what I'm listening to this is what's influencing me right so as I'm being influenced by it I want to be like that except even worse because I always had yeah, I mean like they always say I'm an extremist but the thing is that's how God wired me. See, God wired us all distinctively in a specific way, right? So if you an extremist, it's not to be extreme for the things of the world. It ain't to be extreme for the devil. It's to be extreme for the Lord. So I used to go in any project before I got saved. I would go. I, I, my first time in New York, I went to jail, you know, so. That wasn't, you know, it's something that was in me. So when I got saved, I carry that same intensity towards the faith. And I seem, I'm that extreme about my faith. So I'll go to prison a project as the Lord leads. We was baptizing in Rikers Island. You know what I'm saying? Like we we did a uh, outreach in the Soundview project, worst project in the Bronx, you know? So it's that same intensity, except now it's to my full potential because it's why I was created. So going back to your question, as I was listening to that music and watching those things and then the people that I was hanging around was all doing this stuff so my aspiration was to be the worst one and isn't, that took me isn't it interesting that your dad was trying to do the right thing by working so much to provide and that in a way was kind of pushing you away because you just wanted to have someone to be close to and and be there for you and he was in, in his own way, but that kind of just screwed everything up. Yeah, because, you know, he was a provider, you know, and that's one thing, like, he showed me, like, what a man looks like as far as providing for his family, you know, and he only, he did what he had to do with, with the cards he was dealt, because he come from Cuba, you know, at a young age with nothing. You know, my mama come from Honduras with nothing. They worked their way up from the ground up, so in the midst of that, but I, I just believe I was just living you know, the, the path that was set before me, you know, because at the end of the day, I'm here now and I'm not that, but I got that testimony. So now I can preach to the gangsters. I can preach to the dope fiends. I can preach to the dope boys, you know, because I was in their shoes, you know? So it kind of like it, it all could see the Bible's a living word, right? Mm -hmm. Cause Romans eight twenty eight says he will make all things work together for the good, for those that love him and live according to his word. So, all of that is working together for the good because now I'm here, you know, and I'm in a good space right now. That's awesome to hear. Um, what about the, um, like, when you started to go outside of the lines at a young age, did your family take notice of that right away? Well, yeah, because well, yeah, I was getting it, like, they, you know, 
12, 13, we were still in Jabot jeans. I don't know if Jabot's was popping out here, but in New Orleans, Jabot's was it, right? So we would steal the Jabot's and we'll go sell them on the block. So then we got we we got caught doing that. Me and me and Jonathan, you know, that's he OD eventually. But anyway, he ended up taking his charge at a young age too. Like we both went to we both got locked up. We both got out, but he ended up taking his charge. But then right after that, 13, 13, 14, 14 is when I got jumped in the Latin Kings. 13, I remember they were like, oh, your boy got a gun. Oh, he got a gun? Man, I'm about to jack him out the gun. So I went I went over there. I was like, man, you got a gun? He's like, no, nah, I ain't got no gun. I said, man, I got money. And I pulled my money out. So he's like, so he gives me the gun. So I take the gun from him. I said, this is my gun. He gave me the gun fully loaded. So I just put the gun in my waistline and I walked clean out the house. Now, not in the Bible says the wicked flee when no one is chasing, right? So the next day, my other partner says, hey, your boy stole that gun from dude on the next street and the police is over there. So they call the police. He's like, you want me to hold a gun for you? So I'm like, yeah, right. Now he trying to get me out the gun. I got some, I was like, man, man, you playing games, da, 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 da. So then, uh, but come to find out, cause I was trying to sell the gun to somebody else, but I was going to jack him when he came for the money. I was just going to, I got the gun in my hand, but so he ended up telling the story to his friend on the next street and found out that was the gun that was stolen from their house from a uh, burglary. So next thing you know, I'm sleeping, waiting to go to school in the morning. I'm a freshman in high school. So I was like 13, 14. And, uh, next thing you know, the police, Open my door. My my sister answered the door, <laughs> brought him straight to my room. I'm knocked out sleeping. Next thing you know, I look up. There's nothing but police all in my room. They cut the lights on. They said, where's the gun? I said, what gun? They was like, we're going to tell your mama's house up. Where's the gun? I said, I don't know nothing about no gun. And then I think about it. I'm 13, 14. You know, I had the gun hidden. You know, like you take your dresser drawer out and put, some, and put the dresser drawer back. Mm -hmm. Like that's a fire spot, right? <laughs> But the first thing they move the dresser drawer and the gun flies out the bottom. They said, "What gun? What's that gun?" I said, "Oh, oh that gun. Yeah, that gun." So the next thing you know, they lock me up. I go to I go to lock up. Then uh, I end up getting out, you know, and then have to go to court. But I'm 13, 14. They kicking on my mama's door for possession of a stolen weapon. Then I, after that, you know, when I when I got jumped in, I'm coming house with bruises all over, you know. So they knew. But it was only so much they could do. Like they, they told, they told me better, you know. But I still, at the end of the day, was making my own decisions based upon what I thought was fly, what I thought was cool, you know. And understand, it ain't cool at all. And that's why I'm so, so much of a, a spokesman for this, you know, to let these kids know, like, man, look, that ain't was up. You know, I lost a lot of years of my life in prison, which would be like what they would say the best years of your life, you know. So, I, I you know, they, they knew you can only hide things for so long, you know. And sometimes they don't want to see, they don't want to believe it's that bad until they realize it was really that bad. Is there something you wish they would have done back then now that you're older and wiser? Or do you think that wasn't on them to do? Nah, but... I, my, my parents are really awesome. Like, they really are. Like, like they had every right to just turn their back on me because of all the stuff I put them through. And they never did, you know? I, I when that, Me and my dad got in a fight when I was 16. And uh, and he's like, you think you a man? Get out, you know? And so I left, you know? But uh, it, it's not like they kicked. We actually had this conversation the other day. I'm like, you kicked me out at 16. He's like, I ain't kick you out. You left. I said, well, you told me if I think I'm a man, then go. He said, yep, and you thought you was a man, and you left, you know? <laughs> and I remember I remember stealing $100 out of his wallet because I had just got off a of house arrest for a first-degree robbery. I had just got off a of house arrest. We get in this big fight, and then uh, he said, you think you're a man, Lee? So I went, and then I went in his wallet. Now, I could have took buku money, but I just took a $100 bill because I was like, I, I, I need to, I'm going to need to survive. And I took that $100 bill and scored a $100 slab of Coke, a crack, and then I just started selling crack, you know. And in the midst of that, I, I was my, my friend, his mom, he was like, man, I don't know if you, you know, my mom really don't want you over here, so they let me sleep in the garage. So I'm sleeping in the garage. They got big project rats going around and I'm like I'm 16 years old and I'm like man what am I doing I'm like I'm about to I'm not about to live like this I'm about to get this money you know so then uh 
Then when they found, his mama found out that I was in the garage, she let me sleep in the house. So I'm sleeping on the couch. And then my other partner, he had Buku brothers, and they all was getting money, you know. So he's like, man, you could come stay with me. So I'm staying with him. Now I'm selling even more drugs. I'm going to school with Bally's and Gucci's on. So I'm thinking, like, this is this is it. Like, this the life. This is what the rapper's talking about, and I'm doing it. Then me and him got in a fight. So then my other partner let me stay by him. But... His people didn't want me over there either. So I would have to sleep in the closet at night when the, like the, we would hang out all day where they'd make sure, man, he's gone. Oh, yeah, make sure you don't have that boy in my house. It was like, yeah, he's gone. The whole time I'm in the closet sleeping to wake up to go to school in the morning, you know. So I made my life hard like that. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah, I can't, I can't, I can never blame them for anything because they just, they, 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 they did what they could do with what they had. If we had them here today, how would they describe you at that age? <laughs> well, it depends on which one you talk to. You know, my mom, <laughs> she's always like, oh, that's my baby. And my dad is like, he's crazy. You know what I'm saying? And then, But even, in the, even when I was getting all that trouble, my dad was like, he's not that bad for a boy. Like, like boy, like the men in our, you know, like a bad, you know, so, you know, because it's a lot, man. You know, the Bible talks about generational curses and all that. That's real. Like the first dead body I saw was my Uncle Cisco. That was my dad's little brother. And I remember getting a call that night saying Cisco got shot. That was one of my favorite uncles. He was wild. He was charismatic, you know. And uh, I remember going in my room and getting on my knees and praying that he would be all right. And then there's like, Cisco got shot. They didn't say he got killed. So somebody tried to rob him. He didn't want to up it. They end up shooting, getting off one shot. And the bullet traveled and hit a major artery. He walked in the hospital and said, I got shot. But the bullet traveled, hit a major artery. They couldn't stop the bleeding. And I remember getting to the hospital and seeing my uncles, like, like real hard men crying. And my dad just throws the car in park and he jumps out like they just knew it. And then he's crying. And then the dude that they had that that was with him when the robbery happened, now they choking him up in the, outside the hospital thinking he had something to do with it or whatever. So then he ended up letting me go in the room and I just see his dead body with the tubes and all of that. And I remember touching him and I remember like thinking like, man, your spirit, your soul is everything like Cause he was so much full of life and it was just like, it was just like this microphone, like just there, like no life in it, you know? And it kind of like, I kind of, cause I was like, I prayed and he still died. You know what I'm saying? And then like my, my, my great grandfather, he migrated from Sicily to Cuba. And that's when Bautista had Cuba and they had all the casinos and all of that. Well, he got murdered in Cuba. So then my grandpa was a bootlegger in Cuba. Like he would like their house, they would feed the whole neighborhood. Like it was an open door to where, so it was still good. Like, you know what I'm saying? Cause he was feeding the whole neighborhood. Everybody would come to Abuelo's house, you know, to eat. Like he was taking care of everybody. And he got my dad and his brothers and, and his sister. They all flew down here and they ended up in mid city in New Orleans, you know? So, wow. yeah. So you ended up, uh, joining the Latin Kings at what thirteen or fourteen? Fourteen, yo. That that's such a young age to be a part of a gang. I know, I know, bro. And it, uh, uh, before we dive into that, have you ever um have you ever had these uh, magic mind um these little magic mind uh, energy shots? You ever had one of these? Uh -uh. You gotta try one of these. Um, so they had sent me these, and and I ended up buying some more. Um. They help with productivity uh -huh. and energy, and I've been kind of like waning off the the energy drinks, right? Because I always have like this crash uh, when I take an energy drink. I um um like a, a couple hours later, I, I crash from it. Right, right. So I started taking these, and I just shake them up, put them in the fridge, and I feel like focused and like honed in. If you want to try it, you're welcome to. I'm gonna try it right now, but uh, um, I've been doing these every day, like during my interviews and stuff, uh -huh. and it just like helps engage me, focus more on my work. Don't feel hungover at all. And it's all natural. All natural. It's like a matcha. Um, it, it's a matcha flavored, and uh, it, I don't know. It's good. It tastes way better refrigerated. You have to do it refrigerated, and and it's so good. Oh wow. <laughs> he it. <laughs> I just do it in one shot. It, it's great. Um. There, you know, even I was reading the ingredients on it too, and only three grams of sugar. And yeah, that's good because yeah, sugar, 
Sugar. Chili. I stay away from the sugar. Yeah, 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 I do. Even some of the drinks that say like sugar free and stuff, yeah. they're not actually like they use different flavors and whatnot. Right. Um, but you got to check these out. You know, okay. look into that. And and anyone listening on the show should definitely check out these Magic Mind shots. Uh, they're great. Um, I'll have a little uh, like coupon uh, link in in the description of this so people could check it out. Um, but it, it they're great. I'm telling you. Okay. Yeah, definitely give it a shot. Uh, um, so. Latin Kings at, at 13 years old. Yeah. I guess the biggest question is how do you even, how do you join the Latin Kings at that age? Because that's a pretty prestigious, notorious right. uh, street gang. Yeah, so I knew, so they, they had a dude that was in the Kings. He had just got out of LTI. And then when he got out, like he was with us, there was like a, a party and then we was at the Harvey Lots and we was about to get in a big old fight and he was just seeing the way I was moving. And then he was like, yeah, he's about that, you know? So then as he's saying that, he's seeing how I'm moving. So then next thing you know, you know, cause I was already in the streets. I was already, I would, I would, I would take my, I would take guns and like I had guns at a young age. And then I was like always trying to prove myself and then small man complex. And then they'll talk about I'm the youngest one. So now I feel like I got to prove that I'm even more bad or whatever. So he, uh, I remember him calling me, but it goes back to those movies. Cause American me blood in blood out. I seen, like a bunch of gangster Latinos, you know? So then I'm here in Latin Kings. I'm like, this is like that. Cause I aspired to be like that. I wanted to be the baddest, you know? So then he calls me, he's like, man, look, we got five Kings. They over here on this side. You want to get jumped in? And he's like, I, he's like, I vouched for you. And they know like his word was solid. They knew he was solid. He vouched for me. So I'm like, let's do it. So then they came over there, drive around my way. And then well, I remember we was on Ames and then they, the dude, he had uh, his backyard, like the fence was was knocked down. I was like, well, we could go right back here. So then the dude was looking like in my in my neighborhood, like a block off of my block. He was like, man, this dude's not even scared. Like these five dudes, like he's just ready to do it. And I was scared, you know, I just didn't show I was scared because I was like wanting to be down and wanting that respect overrode the fear because I was like pain don't last long but respect does you know so you know in that insanity because if you knew better you do better I just didn't know better and that's why we go to the hoods and the projects because how they gonna know better if there's nobody there to show them better you know so anyway they end up like nah we can't do it right here this is too main of a street somebody's gonna see it and call the police so then we end up going by another king we went in his backyard they jumped me in Oh, it took two to three minutes, felt like the longest two to three minutes of my life. I remember thinking they were giving me more time. Like while we was fighting, I'm like, what's the time? What's the time? And it was like, man, y'all get like, I thought they was giving me more time, but they would let me get back. They would let me get up. They wouldn't stomp me out when I fell down. They let me get back up and we'd keep fighting. And uh, man, I just think about that. Like, come on, like. How, how insane is that? Right. It's how, fucking how, nuts. How, how whack is that? Like, uh, all right. I'm going to let five grown men, I'm going to let y'all jump me so I could be y'all friend. What would I have to do to keep the friendship? That ended up turning into attempted murder. You know, so and I always tell, when I talk to kids in high schools, I'm like, you got to be yourself. If you got to portray an image, if you got to lie to be somebody's friend, what's going to happen is you're going to end up getting exposed or you're going to end up living a lie. You're going to turn into that lie. And living a lie is living a life with limitations because we were not created to live a lie. We was created in the image of the truth. So we got to first be true to ourselves. Then we could live the life that we were created to live and in that life there's purpose and purpose brings fulfillment and you get peace in it like I, I think about that I'm like man that 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 was that was wild like just thinking now are there rules to it like is there a stopping point like what if you get severely hurt yeah then you don't make it Wait, so mm -hmm. people have been killed uh, well, getting well, no, initiated? No, or? I'm not saying that. <laughs> it's just it's, no. it's strange. Yeah, that yeah, no, getting... because it, it's the, it's just to see like, all right, if you can handle your own, or if you're in a situation like like you can't be soft, you know. So then that process, that's what happens, and then they might like, all right, well, he's just not ready yet, you know. But I, I never, I never seen nobody not not go the distance with that because it's usually you don't just get dropped off there like there's work that you've been putting in where they see all right all right well he he he's bought that now let's just make it let's make it legit and it's crazy because you know what they call they call that the baptism 
Like it's a lot of religious lingo, you know what I'm saying? And the thing is, familiar spirits. So it's like this. Every good lie is based upon some type of truth. If not, you wouldn't believe it. So by these things being familiar, you know, the baptism and this and, and you know, and he's thinking about the king and Jesus Christ is king of all kings, you know. So there's so many similarities, but it's a little bit of leaven, you know what I'm saying? So that's why, I, like, when I when I speak to other kings and there have been a lot of kings that renounce the crown, some of, some of them was threatening me on the uh from the from the inside of thing, but I'm back here in New York, where it where, where it was threatened because we ain't been given the spirit of fear, but a power, of love, and a sound mind. If I wasn't scared when I was running with the devil, I'm definitely not gonna be scared, and I'm running with Jesus, you know. So so yeah yeah nah, it, it it's wild, you know, it's wild, and, and there's rules, there's regulations, you know. It's just like any organization, like Sun Tzu said it in the Art of War. Anytime the people that you're dealing with are in a state of rebellion, there must be built in pressures, you know, so that's where violations and all of this comes to forth. Like even just getting out, like I'm not supposed to just be able to walk around like that. But the Bible says when a man's ways is pleasing to the Lord, he'll make even his enemies at peace with him. So when I said yes to Christ, it was like. I'm ready for whatever, like, wherever he tells me to go, I'm going. Whatever he tells me to say, I'm saying. So what are some of the rules of the Latin kings that you have to follow? And then what are the repercussions if you don't follow them? Well, you know, like, it's just basic, you know, if if one of one pops off, everybody pops off. You know what I'm saying? Like, if you can't run away, you can't back down. And then if these things happen, you get a violation. And even, like, some of the things was, like, based upon principles and morals. Like, you can't mess with one of your brother's girlfriends or, or, or wife. You know, that family's strictly off limits, you know. And then you wasn't supposed to sell drugs and do drugs either. Like, it started, it started with this, with Constitution, you know. But just like with anything, it just keeps going going and getting further away from the initial purpose of why it was structured you know it's just like sin takes you further than you ever plan to go keeps you longer than you ever plan to stay and costs you more than you could afford what about the money structure of it do you guys have to kick money to the top is there like a head of it like you know how in the mafia there's a head and everyone's kind of kicking up money um, in biker clubs, there's like a president and a vice president and, and some of these other street gangs. What's the structure like? Yeah, they had, you know, they, they had structure, but it was, we would have meetings and they would pass a, a hat, you know, and you'd put money in there, like kind of like paying your tithes, paying your dues. And that would go to other people in prison or just to further the organization. Is there certain clothes you have to wear? Well, you would wear black and gold. So it's black and gold are, are the colors yeah. of a Latin king? Yeah, black and, and gold and red. What about race? Can you be any race to join a You have to be of Latin descent. Okay, so you can't be white in the Latin kings. Right, right. Now in the feds. But then they had some. Yeah, in the feds, I I, I saw white guys rolling yeah. with the Latin kings, and, and they would d say like a cousin or something was right. of Spanish descent. Yeah, but yeah. is it possible for a white, 100% white to, to be in it or no? It's not supposed to be. Okay. But, but do you see it happen? I've seen it happen. Anything's possible. The Latin kings are very popular in federal prison. Uh, were you in federal or state? I was in state. State. Or are they popular in the state too? Well, see, in Louisiana, not like not really, because see, when, when the Latin kings was brought from Chicago to Louisiana, they had the Kenner chapter, the Metairie chapter, and the New Orleans chapter. But then they kind of started beefing with each other, too. So, like, gangs really couldn't survive in New Orleans because there's a big spirit of division, you know, so... When you got into the prison, it was more like upstate. They had a lot of bloods and and, uh, and folks. They had some kings, not a lot of kings. But then when I went to that, the last prison I discharged from, I was able to join the kings with the bloods because they both ride under the five and they considered the people's nation. So what we did was, you know, we was on uh, maximum security, have nothing but time to think and plot. I'm right next to the cell with a blood from um, from Houston. And then we ended up joining the kings with the bloods using the same constitution. And we called it outlaw king blood nation. And we basically ran the entire compound. Interesting. So on the street, who are you guys beefing with directly, if any, in Louisiana? It was folks. It was folks and crips. Fo what are folks? I know what crips are. Folks, they, they, they ride under the six. Under the, and the six is another type of gang? Yeah. And when we say beef, is it like you guys see each other on the street, it's a shootout? or is it Yeah, it's whatever. It's whatever. Like yeah. on site, you yeah. guys have to go. Right. How are the police treating Latin kings on the street? 
Oh no, it was a, it was a, it was a mess when everything was happening, you know. But that's just like with anything. Like there's crooked, there's crooked in everything, you know. There's crooked police, there's crooked pastors, there's crooked anything. Man touches, he could corrupt and and make crooked, you know. But and there's also ones that are real, you know. So they had ones, the ones that are real, like they was cracking down. Like when I when we got busted, they had a gang division, you know. So they had detectives that was strictly just trying to like sanitize the entire gang situation. And then when murders and stuff was happening, it was coming into a problem. It was cracking down even more. So then New Orleans is mostly like wards and hoods, like where you from, like that kind of like banged against each other, you know, so. No, and like in TV shows and in other people's cases, there's always in these big gangs, street gangs, there's CIs. Did you guys uh, encompass a, a lot of those? Oh, confidence, like I... I not aside from the from the king, I didn't got like when I one of the times I got busted, it was because the guy was working with the police, you know, within your own gang. Yeah, but this wasn't this wasn't in the gang because this was just in the streets. Because outside, like after the Latin King thing, I was just like real heavy in the streets. So we was bringing it back from Houston, that back to New Orleans, like you know, just like cutthroat. I don't know if you heard of Soldier Slim and all of them, mm -hmm. but all. Uh, you know, we was we was like heavy in the streets with the drug game and the, and the music too. Like I opened up for Kevin Gates, had opened up VH1 Love and Hip Hop. I had a, a song I was doing with Manny Fresh. You know, so all of this, you know, with the cause that that life, cause like I never did just rap about anything. Like I'm not just gonna talk about Lambos if I never had a Lambo. You know, whatever I rapped about, I was actually doing. So. Basically, like, in the streets and that street life and the drug trade and all of that, like, I ran into a CI and I almost I almost lost my life behind that. Yeah. Now, did you graduate high school? I didn't grad. I, I made it. I made it to 11th grade and then I got charged as an adult. But I did get my GED in prison. And my wife be making fun of me because I'd be like, because hey, they told counts. me, yeah, no, no, because they said, I, I tell her, I said, I had the highest scores in the prison. She's like. Andy, that's in the prison. That's nothing to brag about. You had the highest scores in the prison. I'm like, y'all, man, they got some highly intelligent people in prison. Like, you know it. Like, they got, man, uh, the stuff some the stuff we done came up with or people came up with, like, was genius, you know? It's just they went the wrong route with it. So when you got charged at coming out of 11th grade, um, was that the crime that kind of put you away for a few years? Well, that was, no, that, that was all uh, first degree attempted murder, three counts of aggravated assault, one count of aggravated criminal damage, and it was gang related. At, el at 11th grade? Yeah, You got charged grade. with all that? With all of that. How'd you get charged with attempted murder and all of the other charges? Well, a whole situation went on and, and shots rang out, but then dude was in the, one, they had more people in the house. It was one dude outside that was really, you know, and, but everybody else in the house, so then you got a count on everybody that was in the house, plus the house and then it was like gang related so it was like six of us on the charge then the charge I was like one of the last ones to get caught and I remember that day like I, man I did not expect to get caught for that because I was living on the West Bank you know what I'm saying but when all of that happened and they grabbed me but then what, what happened was after three or four months, I got a bond reduction. So when I got a bond reduction, I was able to bond out. So when I bonded out, I was able to finish my juvenile probation from the first degree robbery. And Ms. Williams, she was so cool. So she, uh, she, she, she loved me too. So she like, let me finish my, uh, I finished my, um, my, my paper as a juvenile, like all my community service. So once I finish my community service, I get violated because one of the officers seen I had a medallion with a crown. And uh, part of the stipulation was I couldn't have anything to do with the gang. So then they violated me. First, I, I went to sleep by this one. I was this one. Out, but then I just went, turned myself in. So boom, I'm back in there. But my juvenile PO was able to terminate my case because I finished all my community service. So then she just handed me over to the adult system. So then by me getting handed over to the adult system, I was able to be charged as a first offender. So then I did, uh, you know, I end up getting credit for time served. But in the midst of that, I remember reading the whole Bible, like from front to back. And that would be like when lights was out, when everybody, when everybody was on lockdown, I'd be at the bars trying to get the light off of the hallway to read the word. But I was just reading it like a novel. And, it, and I always say it was that mustard seed of faith because 
I knew I need only God was going to be able to get me out this situation. I just didn't understand like relationship or really understand what I was reading, but I just know I had to read it. If that makes sense. I just, I know this power's in this book and I got to do like, I, I'm asking God to do this. So let me read his word. And I read it from front to back. But anyway, I ended up getting favor charged as a, a, a first degree offender. And I got five years, I got credit for time served. And then I got a five year suspended sentence with intensive probation on this special gang thing to where it was like real super intensive. And then so I get out and I get out, I'm out 18, 19, and then I go back to prison. I go to prison 2021, 20, 22, 23, 24, 25. I got out 26, 27. I went back 28, 29. I got out 30, 31. I ended up overdosing on heroin for the third time. I was dead on the floor. They had to cut through the door with the jaws of steel. That's a whole story there. You know, holy cow! So you were in and out of prison your whole twenties. You weren't kidding yeah. when you said you missed the the yeah. prime points of your life. Yeah. So for that attempted murder um, charge, was that like a drive by or a yeah, shootout? Yeah. So they dropped it down. They ended up dropping it to aggravated criminal damage, saying that we just shot up the house, not knowing nobody was in it. Are drive bys common for Latin kings? Mm, is that like a, a normal mo though like when you guys are going to do something yeah a lot, a lot of people do that and just like gang life yeah, like yeah. is it like does it go down how we see it on tv where it's a, like a group of people in a car like spraying uzis out and in, into a house no a lot of times it is a lot of times it is how do you feel in those moments is it scary like is your adrenaline pumping like what's that like being in the car no, yo, it's, it's, just, it's a lot going on. Cause, so then, and then it goes back to the music, right? Like, that's why I'm a real advocate against that gangster music, you know, because those things have spirits. And it's like, when you think about it like this, you going to you going to kill somebody, you're not going to put on some opera music. You're not going to go put on some country western. You're not going to go put on some R&B. You know, you're going to put on something that's going to, that's going to, like, that's going to buck you up and make you like, uh, you know, because you, you, you speak in those things and those things have spirit. So you listen into the music that already got your adrenaline pumping. You listen to the people that you aspire to be by, be like, that's talking about killing and doing this and that when they ain't killing nothing, you didn't kill 50 people in one song and you ain't never been indicted. You know what I'm saying? So you're listening to somebody that's basically cap capitalizing off of pouring death into a whole generation. And you listen to to it you in there and then now you, you you got your peers that you're trying to look good in front of you're trying to gain that respect and then it's like now you're thinking this is what you aspire to be like because this is what you see this is what's gangster right and so you're like not now you oh, I, i'm a gangster so and then you got the gun so then you feel like you feel like that's power because once you pull a gun on somebody and you see the fear that they have you like that's power like you got this gun on you you're almost fearless because you like but then it goes goes back to this why do you have the gun on you because of fear so everything has a level of fear attached to it like when you go into prison when i first went to prison that young i'm like man because i was going upstairs i was going on the gang on on the gang unit i was like first person play with me i'm gonna bust them in their mouth like if i have to grab like i'm gonna I'm get me a tool like so it was out of fear but that fear push see fear is gonna push you it's gonna be fight or flight you know so my thing was pushing me into fight because i wasn't gonna be like the like the stuff that i see like i wasn't going out like that you know so when you in the car you you adrenaline's pumping you you got a bunch of people that are all really lost and now you bucking each other up, you know what I'm saying? You speak, and then you want to look good in front of your peers, and it's just a whole bunch of mess. And then some people end up serving life sentences behind one decision because they wanted to look cool in front of their friends, and they let this music influence them to do something that they know they shouldn't be doing that's going to cause you to lose your life. And then one thing I always say, like, even doing all that time in prison, I remember my people being mad, you know, and I'm like, and me being mad, I'm like, I'm the one in prison. 
Like, y'all free. Y'all act like I wanted to get caught. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm the one in here. I'm the one 23 and 1. I did 23 months in solitary confinement on extended lockdown. You know, I hear a dude hanging himself two, 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 two cells down from me. Sound like a, somebody's fighting in the cell, and it's a one-man cell because he changed his mind at the last minute, but the way he ties the noose, he couldn't get back on the table, and he ended up dying. Like, I'm the one going through all of this, but then I realized... I put my family through this too. Just because I'm the one physically in here, everybody that you love is going through it in the process because of the love they have for you and wanting to be with you and, and want aspiring for you to be something productive, not only productive, but just free. You know what I'm saying? So just understanding all of that, like, man. It, yeah, I mean, when you're hopping in that car, and this goes for everyone in life, no one's thinking about everything you just said came after that. Right. That's why that's powerful what right. you said, because you need to see the before and the after. Right. You were in that car. You were in that position trying to show off to people and be a part of something that, you know, you got yourself involved in. But then you lived with the consequences of that. Right. And the consequences are what can change people's mind down the road. Right. Right. And then some people don't get a chance to come back out. Yeah. And some people like don't get lucky where someone actually does get murdered right. in that drive by and their, their whole life's thrown away. Over all because you tried to impress someone right. else in that car. Right. And once you're in that car, it's kind of hard to get out of it, right? Uh, like you can't just like say when you're about to pull up on a house, I don't want to be a part of this yeah, anymore, right? No, no, it's over with. And mm -hmm. are you guys in like ski masks or how, are you guys like disguised or anything? No, we have bandanas. Bandanas. Yeah. So it really is kind of like the TV shows yeah, and movies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. That's, yeah. A, that's, uh, it's crazy. Like to, I'm sure you watched it growing up and then to have lived that. Man, so many, like, see, whenever, uh, like with the confidential informant. Mm -hmm. So this is fast forward. We, 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 we're going to hop back and forth because th th just this situation here, like, I was in the car, met this dude. He's talking about these numbers. We going to Houston, bringing it back. And so then this dude's talking about these other numbers. So come to find out, he was actually working with the police, but the police were crooked. So I'm in the car. I got my son in the car with me. Uh, my son was like, my son was like six, seven years old. And the only reason he was in the car with me because I wasn't doing nothing that day. I was just going to pick up money from people like safe houses, right? And then my people calls me and was like, man, look, man, meet me here. Da, da, I'm about to get this for this. And I was like, man, I told you, wait. We need to, we like, we need to really see who this dude is. And he's like, man, I've been with him all day. It's all good. So, boom, I go over there. So when I go over there and I meet, I, I left. I, I, I got mad because I felt like he jumped the gun and I, I, I didn't feel comfortable about messing with the dude. So then I pull off. But then when I pull off, I felt like something bad was going to happen. So I didn't want to leave my people stuck out because I didn't know. I didn't think it was the police. I thought like it might have been a jack move or something. So then I remember grabbing the gun, telling the dude, I said, if, if, if y'all try to play any games, I'm going to shoot you straight. I'm going to shoot you in the head. No, 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 we're not playing games. So then my son's in the car. So then in, in my head, like, this is my people. I don't want to leave my people stuck out. So I think I'm going to drive around the block and the parking lot's so big. If I got to jump out the car and run around and do whatever I got to do, it's not going to jeopardize my son. But I don't want to leave my people stuck out and he ends up getting killed. So then I'm like, and I'm just trying to think fat and I'm smoking weed and all of that. So then I'm in the car. And I'm watching, and I see the dude pull up, see the other dude pull up, and then one, like once the hood came up, all you saw, all you see was police come from everywhere. And it was all they, they had one marked car. They have to have to to show that it's police presence, but all the other cars was like cars that they repossessed from like doughboys. You know, it was like Impalas and and uh, Chevys and all of that. So they 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 jumping out all over the place. So when they jumping out. They haven't rushed me. They rushed in the scene where my people's at with the dude. So I don't know if if it, I, I'm thinking it's the feds. Now, I only been home nine, ten months maybe at the most after doing the five-year bid. So I'm like, I'm not about to. I'm thinking they still, they got a brick in there, you know, because of what, I'm just thinking it's the feds. So then I was like, man, I grabbed a gun. 
and I cocked the gut. I was like, I'm gonna shoot out. Like I'm not going back. I'm not going back to jail this quick on a funny style. I'm just gonna bang out, you know. So then, and not not thinking, just I grabbed a gun, I cocked the gun, and when I come up with the gun, my son jumped from the back seat to the front seat because he's like it's something off a of Call of Duty or something. He's like, wow, and I couldn't pull off because I was blocked in but they didn't rush the car they ran to the scene to the other car so I'm, I'm thinking they don't even know it's me but I can't so then I, I cocked the gun I come up with the gun and my son is to the back of my son's head because he's looking out the window at everything going on and when it when, when it happened like that I know it's the Holy Spirit now I didn't know then but a voice said you can't do this in front of him so uh, and they still hadn't seen me, so I put the gun down and I grab him by his hand and I try to walk him into the blockbuster so I could like run out the back or whatever. So once I get almost when I got to the blockbuster, they done ran up on me, guns drawn. Put your hands on your head, put your hands on your head. Dude, my six, seven year old son got his hands in the air. I got my hands in the air. That kills me to think, like, I'm supposed to be his dad. I'm supposed to be his protector. I'm supposed to be showing him a better way. And he got, they got guns in me and my son's face. You know what I'm saying? And we put our hands in the air, man. And, and uh, man, next thing you know, they, end up, they said, oh, call, call somebody for you. You got somebody that can pick him up. And he's like, he, man, and he gives them, he gives them, which is my cousin, but I told you it's like my sister because we mm -hmm. all like grew up like real close together. Calls her. I'm in the back seat. I didn't, I didn't took the phone. Look, clean up. And then I, I hid the phone in the bottom of the thing. So that the girls at the house trying to get rid of all of the drugs and all get rid of the guns and all of that. And then, and then they taking me from there to the, my house, kick that door in. They caught a dude coming out there with an ounce of coke. They find three more guns in the house. I'm like, man, it, 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 it's over with. You know, but then even in that situation, I end up getting things dry. I had the best lawyer in the city, Frank DeSalvo. You know what I'm saying? But uh, situations like that, I mean, it was a confidential form, and the police end up jacking us out of $15,000 cash that they did not sign the seizure on. They wrote the seizure on like $2,000 that was in my pocket and stole the other money, but by them stealing the other money, it made my case smaller too. And then anyway, I got somebody signed an after David on one gun, and the gun that was in the car, they end up dropping the temp possession of a firearm. But just thinking about all of that, like my story could have ended right there. You know what I'm saying? Like, I was ready to bang. If my son wasn't in there, I would have banged out with them, and it would have killed me right there, and my story would have been over with in 2006. And nothing, none, none of this good. And that's why I'm so adamant, like, about really, like, living for the Lord because I'm on I'm on borrowed time. Like, I like everything, this, not talking about even when I died on the floor overdosing on heroin, like, I shouldn't be here. I'm only here by the grace of God. So no matter where God brings me, I got to always give God glory because my best thinking had me about to shoot out with the police. My best thinking had me looking at a life sentence. You know what I'm saying? So, man, that's crazy. Was that the incident that changed your life? That It wasn't. That it wasn't the no. Wow. So not even that was enough to. No. See, that's where it comes into the whole like life and spiritual factor of it it's like you were given an opportunity there that most people don't get to kind of like change and you still didn't take that opportunity you go through more shit but then you're finally able to surpass that and now you're here to tell the story right so it's just incredible like how life works in that fact that some people get a lot of chances and they are finally able to turn it around and and they're used as like the example to save others like maybe that was your destiny that was your journey from the day you were born like yeah. the, it was your job to share your story, to overcome all of these obstacles, whereas others aren't. Like I look at my position, I literally went through everything that I did so that way I could be given this platform to have people like yourself, for people like me and you to connect. Right. And give people that, like me and you were talking and you said you did a series and they didn't allow you to kind of like put your whole story out there. Right. So maybe that's a way life's supposed to work where you connect with someone like myself who we both are on completely different paths, but somehow we connect. Yeah, right. And life has this weird way of putting the pieces to the puzzle together. And in return, we're helping someone. 
So, you know, it's just so fascinating. And now we in. Yeah, with Ian Bick. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like, that's what I think about that every day. You know, I think about just like why and like how literally every single thing played out in my life on the days where I should have been dead or Come I should, shouldn't have gotten through that, you know? Right. And, and now here we are. Right. It's crazy to think about. You, you know you're preaching right now, huh? <laughs> yeah, I go off sometimes, Come you on, know? Pastor Ian. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Look, Revelations 12, 11, we overcome him by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimonies that we love not our life unto death. Yeah. You know, because at one point we was loving what we was doing. You know what I'm saying? But we didn't love it unto death. Like there was a point where we woke up, you know what I'm saying? And now we get to share the testimony, you know what I'm saying? And that that, that that's biblical right there. And for me, it was just like I like I didn't I didn't struggle with like addiction or get to the point where like like I, there was in between I had lost everything, went to prison, came out and rebuilt a life. But my driving factor for my success now was. I'm tired of people looking down on me because of my past. Right. So that's what drove me. That was my breaking point personally. And, you know, in, in prison, uh, when I was in the shoe, because I did, you know, almost seven, eight months in the shoe, mm -hmm. sometimes all there was to read was the Bible. And that's what I was reading. I would Come literally on. read it and I would take notes. I still have my notes in prison where I Come would like on. highlight parts and, and do that. And I'm not necessarily, I'm more spiritual than, you know, religious, but I did read it and, and I understood it. And a lot of that, like I'm a big quotes person and you've been reciting quotes and it. There's a lot of interesting, inspirational quotes within that. Um, so it's amazing how like prison, you know, people always ask me if prison is reformative, if, you know, that could change you. And it's not prison itself. It's just what you can learn in there on your own. It takes yourself to come to those terms. Yeah, hey, I'm not religious either, you know, <laughs> but uh, yeah, nah, nah, it, it's what you do with it. Malcolm X said prison penitentiary is second best to, to college, you know, so it's like what you do with that time. Like, I remember going in prison and seeing these dudes coming from Angola with life sentences, like zeros on a rap sheet, no out date, no parole date. But they were smiling like they had the joy. They had joy. And I don't understand it was the joy of the Lord. But I remember, so you know, when you first go, you got to go to these different call outs at the prison. So when I go and they, they're talking about this program that the life was started at, at the Quincy. It was a chaplain's program. It was a faith based program. And uh, they was all so happy. I was like, man, these dudes lost their mind. So I'm thinking this is how they're dealing with. A life sentence. They just went crazy. They lost their mind. But then the Bible says the cross is foolishness to those that are perishing, but to us that believe it's the power of God unto salvation. So really, they weren't the ones that lost their mind. I was the one that was out of my mind. It didn't make sense to me because I was perishing. I was seeking my own selfish desires. I didn't change. I had I had such a twisted rationale in prison. You know, you know, like when I was in prison, this is what I would say. What I'm going to be good in prison for If I wanted to be good I would have did that on the street I'm not going to be good now If not I would have did that on the street And I wouldn't be here So I'm just going to be bad in here too So then I was locked up, locked up, locked up You know, so then it's like Going to extended lockdown I remember being in De Quincey and then it was like a zero tolerance camp. They didn't have a cell block. They just had the way, way, like for an offense or they'll ship you. Like they didn't have extended lockdown. It was medium security prison. And I had five years and they didn't have no drugs on the compound. They didn't have nothing. So I'm like, man, I'm not about to do five years over here. You know, so then I, I really just said, and it's, it's funny how when you set your mind to something, like somebody, you could be having a bad day and just disgusted and be like, if my manager goes off today, I'm, today's the day I'm quitting. You know what I'm saying? Like, this is how I was in prison. I was like, man, I'm just going off. Next thing happens, I'm just going all the way off. And then it was just, I was working in the kitchen. I went all the way off. It was early in the morning. And a, and the guy was telling me I missed the table. The little sergeant, he did like that. I missed, you missed the table. And he almost hit me in my face. I'm like, you better watch where you put your hands. At so then, uh, so then uh, he said something and I said something, but then he's like, J -j 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 he walks off. So then I finished doing all the tables. I finished the whole feed in the whole prison, and then he calls me. Come here. Put your hands behind your back. I'm like, what? 
You could have did that two hours. Like, after I done fed, cleaned the whole kitchen for the whole prison, now you going to lock me up? I went all the way bananas. They didn't hit the beeper on me. They grabbed me. They, they had to uh, cuff me, fully restrain me. I, I'm tussing with all of them, hit one of them against the wall. So now I'm down. So now when I'm down and I'm coming, they bringing me out. The 1019 cell block traffic, they shut the walk down. So when they shut the walk down, I realized he's one of the ones cuffing me. So then I run him. They had pillars in the middle of the walk. I run him into the thing he runs into the thing because he's holding me so I went to the side he runs into the thing next thing you know they hit the beeper on me again now they pick me up in the air and I'm like flying to the cell block and then I get behind the other door and the lieutenant they was all waiting for me out there I remember I thought they was going to kill me that's the first no, that's the second time I got sprayed with, with deep freeze I'm talking about what is, so it's deep freeze oh it, it's like worse than May so what it does it, it, it just it, it chokes you it takes your breath and it burns so then they, they sprayed a whole can came back with another can in my cell now I'm, I'm trying to mash up with the thing because I couldn't breathe you know and the next thing you know I, I get shipped to Allen I get shipped to Allen once I'm at Allen prisoners basically run Allen it was private owned it wasn't ran by DOC and there's no there's no like like the the guards are in the middle they all they, they, they're not there with you and I remember being I got into some stuff over there you know and then once I got into some stuff over there I was about to get in a knife fight the dude because I ended up breaking in the dude's locker next to me but come to find out he was undercover for another dude and the other dude was had like 50 years plus life I had five years so now he's going to earth unit trying to buy two knives to come so I'm trying to get tooled up with my partner now we on the big yard and I got five years you know what I'm saying? Like, so then, but look, 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 look how God works. So now nah, this dude, he, he wants to kill me, but I'm like, I'm going to kill him. But I got five years. He got, he's not, he's not coming home. So, but I get locked up because I used to play sick call all the time. So I could talk to the nurses, you know, like if you make the sick call for the same thing, they only take $2 out your account. But if you make it for the same thing, they can't keep taking the $2 out your account. Cause you're making it for the same thing. And I was making it, I was reading books and they're talking about migraines. So I was trying to like act like I had a migraine, not, not a migraine at all. Um, like uh, a, a tumor in my brain by saying the headaches were coming. I read the book and I knew the symptoms and I was, cause I was trying to get a trip to go to the hospital on the streets, you know? So anyway, by me making these sick calls, they put me on, on, uh, on, on, a, on a, not the sick call, the uh, pill call. But if you don't go to pill call, you get rolled up for aggravated disobedience. But by me just getting out the cell block for the battery on the officer, I was on like a probation period. So I missed the pill call because I was on the big yard waiting for the dude if we was going to get in a knife fight or whatever. So then I get locked back up because I had the aggravated disobedience and I was on probation. So now I go to the cell block, but the dude's not on the cell block. So that look how God got me out the picture, right? Because me and him was gonna do because he already knew so then i'm on i'm in the cell block so they send me to a working cell block so you got to do 90 days without a write-up before you get to the compound so while i'm on the working cell block they feeding tuna fish but they gave us one scoop now the tuna fish was fire present tuna fish is yeah, pretty good yeah no, i love that it was <laughs> yeah so yeah i think but they gave us one scoop now the compound gets two scoops but we're in the working cell block. So the compound gets two scoops because they work. We're in the working cell block. We still got to go to work. We just got to come back to a cell. So I'm like, we should get two scoops too. So then it was like, yeah, you right, Paco, bro. Well, we should get two scoops. I'm like, man, I start racking the balls back. I'm like, wait, man. What we gonna do about it? We just gonna let them give us one scoop. So then everybody, so I got the tear bucked up. So now we, we racking the cell balls back. They throwing trays in the hallway. So the other thing coming back. So now we got we sent the kite to the next tier and the next tier. Now everybody's bucking. We going on a hunger strike. We want two scoops. So everybody's throwing the trays back down. They burning stuff. People racking the balls back. So then uh my celly, he was like, nah, Paco, you gotta do it like this. He's older than me. He lays down and he starts kicking the the the, the cell doors with both feet. It sounded like thunder. I was like, so he's 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 going bananas too, right? So then we're bucking all of that evening. Then that night cut, we 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 denied the food. So next thing you know, 
All you hear, now everybody's bucking, they racking bars back, they burn straight, they throwing stuff on the hallway, everything shut down, people can't come down to tears. Next thing you know, you hear, doof, 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 doof. we looking out the window, I can see down the walk, because the window was in front of us. They called it, they, they got a special tactical unit from other prisons to come, and they're doing this specific, I, I, it looked like Ninja Turtle suits, because they got the face mask, they got the, 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 the shield, they got the electric shock shield, and they got like full body armor, and they're doing this march, because it's to embed fear, you know, and it, it worked. So look, so they're coming down there, they're doing that, so then everybody, so they're they hitting, tier by tier instead of hitting everybody at one time and all of a sudden you just hear grown men screaming sounding like women like screaming and then uh, so I, as people are screaming my Sally, the one that was said no you kick it like this he was like call, call the man I said what he said I got asthma people I got asthma people call the man call the man I was like what he's like I got asthma I got asthma so he's like yeah, he's having an asthma attack so I start calling so so cell I forgot what cell cell five man down man down so he opens the the the, uh, the plexiglass from the front of the shield he said what you said I said man down and I told him what cell he said yeah well there's gonna be a lot more of y'all down in a minute so then the dude's like, oh, my God. So he so he gets on his knees and he starts praying. I start making fun of him. I'm like, man, this dude's on his knees praying in here. He's scared of death. Da, da, da. Like it was funny. So the next thing you know, they doing cell by cell by cell by cell. He's like, Paco, don't let them see your face. They're going to come in here. They're going to come in here. And sure enough, they stopped in front of my cell. They had a whole a whole five-gallon thing woof, spraying it into the cell. Next thing you know, like clouds of deep freezers coming in there. I can't see. I can't breathe. He done hid under the rack. So next thing you know, that when they get in there and they start stomping me down they put the shackles on they hitting the shackles and they hitting it against the rack making the shackles bite up all the way and then they and then i'm cuffed behind my back with shackles and they said pick them up drop them pick them up so and i can't cover myself because i'm my hands are behind my back and i got shackles on they picking me all the way up in the air and dropping me on the floor picking me up in the air and dropping me on the floor then they drag me out by the shackles and lay on top of me with the electric shock shield i mean i was like what is that and then boom like I was out and then next thing they, they dragging me off the tier skull dragging me I'm looking and then remember I told you my celly was praying right yeah they walk him out the cell they didn't beat him they didn't spray they didn't electrocute him they just walk him out the cell and I thought like not you know hindsight's 2020 like now that I am in a position of faith and I know God's real I'm like wow see I I mocked him and laughed at him for for praying and look, he walks out, not even getting touched, and they almost kill me. I was like, man, you can't make this stuff up. Like, God is real. You know what I'm saying? Jesus Christ is real. Next thing you know, we're all in the hallway, all over all on our faces, and they put us all on the tier, put us all on strip cell, no clothes, little garment, and then they're coming through, the, they're coming through with the food loaf to where it's basically all of the food, the trash from the trash, they mix up all the food together from the compost and put it in the oven. It stinks. Like when it, it's just like a big thing of, of just all food mixed together with flour and they throw in the oven. So we denying it. We're not eating it. We on hunger strike. Dude that's working the uh, the halls, he's taking the food that's coming in and throwing it in the trash can. Then that shift change at night, 1030 at night, they would pass the, the trash bag and we would pass the trash bag from cell to cell and eat out the trash bag because they wasn't feeding us, you know? And we did that. We did that for two and a half days. On the third day, now, this these records go to DOC headquarters. So before it gets their attention, it has to be, be a three to four day time period of this hunger strike. It gets DOC's attention. Then they come see what's going on in the prison. So the warden comes on the tier. Who wants to eat bacon and eggs? It's like, what? It's like sign this paper and I'm gonna serve y'all gonna get bacon and eggs. I was like, man, no oh man, don't sign that. Like, we ain't signing that. And then next thing you know, dude was like, man, forget you. I'm hungry. So he's signing it. Next thing signing it. I'm like, I ain't signing up. But then by the time it got to me, everybody didn't sign. There's only three more signatures. So, so I signed it too. I mean, bacon the next. Next thing you know, the buses come. They put us all on the buses, take us back to Hunt ARDC and split everybody up, you know. So once that happened, I ended up going to DCI. Then I got shipped from DCI on disciplinary to WCI. Then the 
felt like so many situations of me going to war with the people. And I and I always seen because it was like the respect you would get after. Like whenever you they shut the walk down and people like Paco and they talking about how crazy you are and all of that. You start getting addicted to that. But that go falls into the approval of man. Mm -hmm. So then when I think about my life. Why I got jumped in the Latin Kings, the approval of man. Why I used to act bad because of the dudes that I was coming up under was doing gangster stuff. I wanted the approval of man. And that when you live life for other man's approval, you'll die from their disapproval. So now you basically compromise and do all things that you know that's not even you to do, but because you want their approval. See, God has stripped me from the approval of man. Now, I don't care what man says about me. I live for the approval of one, and that's Jesus Christ. As long as I'm obedient to what he says, because even in the faith, you know, like you was talking about religion, religious folks is the ones that kill Jesus. It was the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and they still trying to kill people today. That's the ones that throw the stones at me. Oh, what you doing on that show? Oh, why you got a chain on? Oh, what? Oh, rap, raps. That's not of God, man. The devil is a liar. You hear me? Like I'm just quoting scriptures in my music. I got these kids speaking life and not death. If I give you my pain, I give you my solution. If I give you my pride, I give you my fall. I don't do. I don't just drop you off there. You know what I'm saying? So, man, like going back to what we were saying, everything happening for a purpose. You know, but in that transition, there was a lot, a lot going on, even in those gaps when I would come home and my grandma saying that, you know, having visions of me preaching and all of that. I'm like, man, grandma, <laughs> like she really said, like, I remember coming home for five years and she was like, Andy, you going to be good. I'm like, what you mean I'm going to be good? She was like, I, I had a vision. I was like, well, what was the vision? God's going to show you. I'm like, abuela, that's grandma in Spanish. I said, you got to tell me what you saw because I don't see nothing. At this time, I'm pimping. I'm we, we dealing with the cartel, bringing it back. I'm a mess. You know what I'm, I'm not like I, I'm doing drugs and nobody knows. So I'm doing it on a slick because I got the drugs. So it's like a lot of, you know, it was just darkness. And she tell me that. And I was like, you need to tell me what you saw. She tells me, sit down. I sit down. She said, I was in church. I was praying. And I looked up and you was on the pulpit preaching. I'm like, what? I'm like, oh. Poor baby, grandma fell asleep in church. Like, there's no way. I'm not even saved. You talking about preaching? But see, she knew who she was in Christ. And John 15, 7 says, if you abide in me and my word abides in you, then you can ask any request and it shall be granted. That's reciprocal. You got to do something to obtain it. She was abiding and her prayer was that I would be a mover and shaker for the kingdom of God. And I wish I could tell you I got it together. I ended up going back to prison and she ended up dying when I was in prison. And I couldn't even go to the funeral because I wouldn't tell the wardens how he was getting the cell phones in. You were getting cell phones into yeah, the prison? Yeah. And, she, and, and, and he was trying to use that as leverage. When my grandma died, you want to go to the funeral? Well, we know you got a cell phone. And we know how would the cell phones get, because they could never catch me with the cell phone. But they knew because they had confidential informants, but they couldn't catch me with it, and they couldn't get two to cooperate with the same story. So, But I wouldn't tell them. So I couldn't go to the funeral. And then that even kills me, because I was like, I kept it more street. I kept it realer with this code, so to say, that we live by than my grandma that basically raised me, that has always been there for me. I couldn't even go to the funeral. You know, but that's how it be, man. When you're in that life, you just get so deluded by your own vanity. It's like you blind. And that's why the Bible says he calls you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So that means once you come into Christ, he illuminates things that's always been there. He illuminates you to you. Like this is what you were created for. Did that vision that she saw end up coming true? Yeah. Yeah. How many years after that was that? How many years after? That was in 2006, seven. Yeah, because I went back. That was in like 2006, seven, And that came to pass in 2016, 2016. 17, like 10 years later. Incredible journey you, you went through just to get to that point. <laughs> and all the stops that you shouldn't have really survived yeah. or, or been able to talk about. Right, right. It's, it's so crazy. When you think about it, um, when was your last uh, prison sentence? My last prison sentence, I discharged in 2010. 2010. And 
what why was that the last one what did you finally come to terms with that made you say i'm done oh no i wasn't done <laughs> but that was just the last sentence because that's when we joined the kings with the bloods okay so then when i got out on the streets like i i, I took that to the streets and then uh, you know we we dealing with we dealing with the cartel we dealing with this but in the midst of all of that my wife ashley she was my girlfriend at the time she gets pregnant so when she gets pregnant I like man. She start. She was. She was praying. She she grew up Christian. I grew up Catholic, so I kind of had religion. I didn't know about having a relationship. So she knew. You know, she would go to Houston with me. Like you know, she got blind hair, green eyes. I would put the money in the car, get the money over there, deal with them, and then get somebody else to come back. So we doing all of that. But then she gets pregnant, and then she's like, she's having this baby with or without me. She's like, look, if you, if you want to be there, you don't have to. I'm not killing my baby. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, like you don't have to be with me. But I, whatever, you know. But she was. Praying, sincerely praying. I remember this one night, I bought, I bonded out on some some little some little charges or whatever. It wasn't nothing major. It was like attachments or something. And I'm in a hotel with two two girls. They in there taking a shower, and I thought about when she telling me about the doctor's checkup. And I call her two something three in the morning and tell her to come get me. Now you you look. This is God. I got two girls taking a bath together. And I think about her and tell her to come get me and so I could make it to the doctor's appointment for her because she was pregnant. And then we've been together ever since. You know what I'm saying? Like, and then the girl I was with ended up setting my clothes on fire <laughs> in my house. And I had work in the house and all of that. Like, that was just, God was just closing all of these doors. You know what I'm saying? But then as I'm doing all of this, so in my head, I'm like, man, I want to be there for this kid. You know, because what killed me was not being there for my other kids. Like prison, you know, prison is prison. Like I, I was selling drugs in prison. I was getting money in prison, you know? So I, I, I know how to do time. What hurt me was watching my kids grow in pictures and my kids coming on visit, not understanding why I got handcuffs and shackles, you know, like that's what killed me. And then when she was pregnant and I had another opportunity to be there for the kids, but I still... My my cousin ends up getting popped by the feds. He he ended up like two hundred and ninety thousand dollars conspiracy to to for thirteen kilos. So when the feds grab him, I'm like, man, we got like if they looking at him, they looking at. But it wasn't looking at me. It was something that was going on over there. But it still scared me enough to where I, it's too close. So I shut everything down. I remember, man, I tell me, the guy guy was with me, man, because I remember shooting some coke. And then when it, when I get the call that that happened, I don't know if this a fence down here or down there or what. So and I had like a quarter brick. I climbed this tree in the in my backyard. I had just shot some coke, so raw coke. So then I climbed this tree because in my head, I'm like, if I could hide this coke up in this tree, the dog's not going to be able to smell it. I didn't want to get rid of it because this is all I had. It's like a quarter thing. So I climb all the way up this tree to tie it up there. And by the time I get all the way up, I look down. Like, I see the whole back of Ames from back here. I'm like, and my partner's looking like, dude, what are you doing? And I'm looking at him all the way down. He's like, how are you going to get down? I'm like, how am I going to get down? Like, because the height wore off, you know, like, man. But <laughs> that that was the grace of God. Anyway, I climbed down. I hide it somewhere else. But then I was like, I got to shut this all the way down. I'm not going to get back locked up. So then it's too hot. So then I start working with my dad. So now I'm trying to do right without Christ. Right. So then it's just a matter of time to where, man, I start getting in wreck, like like getting in wreck. So I'm doing the, the, the secular rap. I'm opening up for uh, Kevin Gates, opening up for other people. And I and I total the bends. I don't even remember how I got home that night, you know, and I'm going to jail. DWI, the month before I totaled the Benz, I totaled the truck running into the levee doing like 60, 70. They didn't give me a DWI. They gave me reckless operation and all of that. Like kept getting these wrecks. And then now the last time I overdosed on heroin for the third time, me and her got into it. And I was like, man, I just want to get away from reality for a minute. You know what I'm saying? That's how I knew how to escape. So I just want, so I go to get this coat, I go to get the dope and I, I got the rig and then I end up going to the gas station, locking the door and I shoot the dope and I shoot the dope. I go out, boom. The dude that was with me, 
He tries to open the door, but I lock the door. He tries to get the manager to open the door. The manager l- lost the key. I'm dead on the floor. The door is locked. He can't kick the door in. It's a steel door and a steel frame. And I found this out just recently. I never even really publicly shared this part of my testimony. One of the cops that responded to that call was a Christian, and he was praying for me that day. It was his first time working in the field. So while I was dead in the store, he was praying for me. Fast forward, when I opened up a church in my living room, his daughters was coming to the church. Then he came to the church to see where his daughters was going, had the grand opening, and he realized I'm the one that he was praying for that OD in the in in the in the in the uh at the at the Circle K. But watch this. When they call the fire department and the police department because they can't get the door open, the fire department was responding from another call because that fire department was too far away. I was dead on the floor. If they would had a came from way over there, I wouldn't have made it. But they was coming in from another call, get the call, and then pull right into the parking lot, like right there, and had the jaws of steel. Cut through the door, cut the door open. I'm dead on the floor. They shoot me with two shots of Narcan. Shoot me with one, shoot me with another one. Finally, uh, I come back, but I didn't come back through till I was in the hospital bed with IVs hanging out my arm. I remember looking. I know I had more dope on me, and I look and I see the police officer in front. When I look down, I'm not cuffed. I just got IVs all over the place. So I'm paying possum. I'm waiting for him to move. I said, as soon as he moves, I'm out of here. Because I know I have, and I'm already a two, like, this is going to be three my three-time three time felon. So uh, three strikes you out, right? Well, three strikes brought my salvation and deliverance. This was the part that really rocked me. So then I'm looking, as soon as he left to help somebody that came in drunk, I ripped the IVs out of my arm and I broke out running. I broke out running. I made it through one door, but when I got to the other door, they have to buzz you out of that door, and they grab me. And it brings me back to the scripture. God will open doors no man can shut, and shut doors no man can open. A lot of people praise God for open doors, but they need to praise God for the doors he closed. I thank God for some of my unanswered prayers because I was so immature when I was asking for some things, right? But anyway... So, boom, I go back to lock up. Boom, I bind out. Now, I, my, my wife, when she has the she has the kids, she, we weren't married yet. Our son was born with polycystic kidney disease. There's no cure for it. Life expectancy is three months. It's, a, it's basically the kidneys are born with multiple cysts, so they, they lose function, and they have to take, they have to have a... a a transplant, but their bodies are too little to endure such a procedure because of the immune system. So basically they die. Life expectancy is three months. So when our son was born with that disease, she started going back to church by herself. I remember being in the hospital, getting loaded, trying to bag up, having the stuff in the parking lot, people still trying to make money and, you know, just a mess, like a whole whirlwind of just a mess. So anyway, she's going to church by herself. Then my lawyer, which been my lawyer, he said, look, you better go to N.A., A.A., a, B, C, you heard me, triple A, you better go to church, you better get involved with the church, like, you gotta give me something to work with, cause you look like a monster on paper, you a coach six career criminal, like, yeah, so I'm like, man, my girl's telling me to go to church, now my lawyer's telling me to go to church, I better go to church, you know what I'm saying, like, so that's why I started, that's when I started going, and it was just that one time, Pastor Anthony Marquise gave his testimony, and I was drawn to that altar, long story short, man, I ended up getting sentenced to the church, mandated by the court, in my minutes, they said, if he leaves, if he gets kicked out, we vacate the sentence, take him back to trial on the initial charge, and triple bill him, Wow. so I'm like, God just parted the Red Sea of the Louisiana judicial system. You know what I'm saying? Like, he's real. My whole, like, once I realized how real, it was like I, I, I changed teams. I took off that devil jersey and I put on that Jesus jersey, and I've been starting ever since. You hear me? You know, the criminal justice system so fucked up and, and unfair and everything, but I will say that states have a lot more power to give someone a second chance than the federal level. Oh. They're more willing to make a deal— and, and give you an opportunity because if that was a Fed charge, you'd yeah, be still no, be in yeah. prison right yeah, now. Yeah, especially because of my conviction. So yeah. my numbers, they, they would have been too high, but yeah. And that's when the system fails and that's also when it works. I mean, look at you. It gave you a second chance when 
and anyone dies, you shouldn't have been given a second right, chance. Right. Not to say you didn't deserve it, but just like the way it looks yeah, from. Yeah, black and white. Yeah, you makes, shouldn't have been given right. a second chance, but now look at where you are today. So that's the real fucking problem with the criminal justice system, you know? Yeah, no. Nah, even the DA that was here in the case, like he even said he was commanded to comply. See, he wasn't supposed to say that. You know what I'm saying? That's in my minutes because it, the article that they found, they said if the if the third felony is not a capital offense, he's eligible for a suspended sentence with the requirement he completes a one-year in-house treatment program. Yeah. So, so when my toy started going to church, I go early and they have a graduation going on. I'm like, what is this? They got a one-year in-house treatment program discipleship pro at their church i was already going to and they wasn't supposed to accept me because of my jacket right but they said the holy spirit told them to give me a chance so all of these things lined up i remember my lawyer saying look i'm asked for one more continuance because the da was ready to pick a jury she was like because they, they said look we're going to give him five years you know with his jacket but then i was talking to frank i'm like but that's going to be with the triple bill though because i'm a three-time felon like when i get the doc they're going to double bill me he was like well yeah they can they can probably 10 15 years he's like but 15 years with your jacket like you could do that like you look based upon 30 or 40 i'm like 15 i done did eight and a half like it's like I ain't never been there, you know, because I'm thinking about my kids again. It's like I've never been there for them, like, their whole life. So I remember my daughter, like, 13 years old, I let her drive my Cadillac because I wanted to be a, 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 be able to at least say I taught her how to drive because I was going to take the time the next day. I was going to go take that time. And I remember my son not crying and hurt. Like, it, it, it just broke me. I remember crying all that night, and I'm telling my, my girl, which is my wife now, I'm like, look, you don't have to wait for me, you know, just go on with your life, but I'm not going to stop serving God. I'm just going to have the best prison ministry they got. I'm going to serve God in there. And she's like, well, it's not over. It's not over. So when we get to court, they all praying simultaneously. My lawyer comes in. He said, look, you're going to need the stars to align just right. Man, my God created the stars. You know what I mean? He's like, you're going to need the stars to align just right. I'm going to ask for one more continuance. So when they up there, when he asked me to continue, the, the DA is like, he don't want the five with his jacket? Oh, no, no, it's not going to get any better. We could pick a jury today. We could pick a jury today. They're going to lose him. He don't. He's like, look, I'm working on some things about a program. that does. I, the, look, I don't know about no program. He said, look, just give me one more continuance. You know I'm not a liar. So then it, based on the strength of him, they gave me one more continuance. And that's when they find that article and they got with the DA and they end up let, I end up going to the program. So next time I come back, I'm already in the program and they sentenced me to the program. But I was I always say, dude, I got sentenced to the church. Crazy. Yeah, I've I mean, never heard of this before. I've never heard of it. <laughs> I'm like, look, and I'm talking to God. I'm like, God. Why you ain't been sentenced me to the church? That's what you did. Like, every time I went to DOC, I done been in almost every institution in Louisiana. I was at De Quincy. I was at Bogard. I was at Allen. I was at DCI. I was at WCI. And everywhere I got shipped was based upon disciplinary action. I did 23 months in solitary confinement on extended lockdown. None of that ever, ever helped me. Like when, like when I did the 23 months in solitary, I did nothing but read. But I was reading The Art of War, Sun Tzu. I was reading Machiavelli. I was reading, I was reading every, I was reading the Quran. I was reading about Buddhism. And I had a Bible. But that was like the last one I picked up because I read it before when I was a teenager. But it was like I read everything else because I was the, wanted to go start this empire when I hit the street. But even that, God don't waste none of that because now I can minister to the Muslims because I know the Hadiths. I was almost a Muslim. I was about to take my Shahad in prison. That's a whole nother story right there. Yeah, there's so much that so you've many. just experienced yeah. so much. Mm -hmm. How hard was it to renounce gang life and, and disassociate yourself from that? Man, so the way God moved in my life, I knew he was real. And then... Remember, my son was born with the disease, right? Mm -hmm. So they said, oh, my wife, she's my wife now, but she she said she went to the doctors and they said, look, his levels are all the way up. We're going to have to, he's going to need, he's going to need a kidney transplant. Now he's two years old. So basically they're saying he's going to die. And I remember I wanted to leave, but if I left, 
I was just going to jail, you know? So then I was like staying there, but God was showing me how to fight my battles through prayer and supplication. So, and the other guys in the program, they was watching me go through this battle. I was like, look, we're going to see God move. So I started praying with all of them for my son, praising and worshiping, crying. And I remember grabbing the Bible, the devil battling me this, this whole day. I'm visualizing a baby casket and what I'm going to say at my son's funeral. Like it was so, it was tangible. Like I, I, I was visualizing it. It was like, what are you gonna say at your son's funeral? And, and then I, it was just weighing on me. So I remember like, nah, he's not. I'm not coming into agreement with that. God, I know you real. I grab my Bible, and I throw it. I throw it down. Uh, it, it was outside. It, it, it was. It was on the deck at the church, and I throw the Bible down, and I'm crying out to the Lord. I'm like, Lord, don't let my son die. Don't let my son die. And as I'm crying out to the Lord, the wind blows. And this is New Orleans, West Bank, like it's dry. Summertime, like it's not no cool breeze. It's like, it's like dry heat, right? So then the wind blows. And when the wind blew, the pages of the Bible started flipping open because the wind, the gust of wind came. And I knew God was giving me something right there in that moment. I didn't want to touch it. I'm just looking. As soon as the wind stopped, I looked to see what it fell on. And John 15, 7 just like jumped. It was like illuminated to me. And it says, if you abide in me and my word abides in you, then you can ask any request and it shall be granted. So it was like, all right, I abide in you. I know you real. Like I, I would, I'm not in Angola. You hear me? Like I know you real. And then he said, and my word abides in you. See, that's where he got me. Because, all right, I knew he was real, but how am I going to abide in his word if I'm not reading his word? So that's when I understood that it was more than just going to church. I couldn't just read his word. I had to live his word, abide in his, abide in his word. I had to live in his word. So then I can ask any request. And that's what I was asking for my son to be healed. In that moment, I knew that I couldn't just go to church and just be a church attender, a member. Like I had to be the church. I had to do exactly what this book says. And that's where one accord jumped off the, like God was just giving me the vision of what I was going to do when I got out the program. And look, my little soldier, he's 12 years old. You hear me? That disease, he still got the disease, but it's not affecting him the way it should. Then they battled him. Then, then they said he was autistic. He didn't talk till he was almost four years old. And now the little dude don't want to be quiet. You hear me? <laughs> he's not in special ed no more. He's an honor roll student like all of this is like how like I know that I know that I know that I know Jesus is real you know what I'm saying so in the midst of that you know like man how could I go back you had to be done I had to be done what do you do now what's now, a, what's your life like now I do I do Christian hip hop you know so I, I, I do that I travel all over the nation they, I've been requested outside of the country but because of my jacket like I couldn't get my passport but now I'm in the process of getting my passport back and my lawyer the dude Frank he said look Go if they don't want to give your passport back, I'm gonna take you back in front of the sentencing judge and I'm gonna uh, get your expungements so I, right now, I do the Christian hip hop. I'm working on an album right now. I just dropped a, a couple of new videos. I do. I'm a pastor. You know, I pastor a church on the West Bank of New Orleans. I'm an evangelist. I travel around preaching. Like I'm out here because I'm doing a conference tomorrow in the Bronx, and then I, I'm preaching at Fordham Manor Sunday in the Bronx. Then you know, so I travel with the gospel. I'm first. I, I, I'm a man of God. I'm a husband. You know what I'm saying? I'm a dad to my children. I'm an evangelist, mentor. You know. Just however God can use me You know we do outreaches In the worst neighborhoods Not only in New Orleans But in America You know we in the Pork and Bean Project We in the Soundview Projects We in the Bronx We in where, where, As the Lord leads We was in Cali Ministering to the Bloods and the Crips You know baptizing them You know so God's really doing it You know and the Bible says He chose to despise things of the world To confound the wise you know, because that's how he gets the glory. Because can't nobody take credit for this but God. You know what I'm if saying? If we had your parents here in the room right now, what would they say about you now? After you've gone through everything you've gone through, you've learned what you need to learn, what would they say? They say he's a miracle. <laughs> <laughs> they say he's a miracle. And then they, they, they say, uh, I don't know, they be tripping out off of me, though. They was like, 
Yeah, he was crazy before. Now he's crazy for Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> How is your relationship with them? Oh, it's good. It's good. I work with my dad. You know, he got a sandblasting company, like pipe inspection, NDT testing. So I get to work with him, with my oldest son, you know. So we work like half a day. And then, you know, I still got my pastor. Like, you know, got a lot, many hats. Like, however, whatever I could do, like, I just want to be used by the Lord. If you could go back to right before when you joined the gang, when you were a teenager, a young teenager... What would you say to him right now? If you were in a room with that version of yourself back then, now. Cool. If I was looking at little me, I'm like, man, you in for a lot of pain. That life that you think you want to live is going to bring a lot of pain, not only to you, but everybody you love in the process, it's not what it's cracked up to be. Those rappers, they're lying to you. They're not really living like that. And you're going to really do those things that they're talking about. And it's going to bring destruction to you and everybody that you love in the process. The best years of your life you're going to spend in a cage. You don't want to do that. It's not fly. It's not what's up. It's not cool. The Lord, I'm telling you, is so much better. Listen to your abuela. Listen to our abuela. Jesus Christ is real. It's not a fairy tale. And he wants a relationship with you. And in that relationship, you're going to get a peace. The peace that you're looking for. The approval you're looking for. Because when you get in the gang, you're thinking you're going to get this approval. You're thinking that you're going to be a part of something so great. But there's nothing great outside of Christ Jesus. There's nothing great outside of him. You can hit these plateaus. You can hit these short-term and long-term goals. But when you get there, you're only going to realize that it's still empty. When I was in that light, man, well, you, you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna do time. You're going you're gonna to run a prison gang. And that's what you think that you want to do watching American Me and Blood In, Blood Out. And you're going to get there only to realize that this ain't it. You're gonna get you're gonna get a kilo, you're gonna break down kilos and you're gonna get it. You're gonna think you scarface only to realize that's not it. Because I obtained all the things that I aspire to get only to get it and be like, man, I'm still not fulfilled. Like I still want more. Like it's not enough. And then the Bible says, the wicked flee when no one is chasing, but the righteous are bold as lions. It's a, then it says, the Lord refuses to satisfy the craving of the wicked. And if you think about it, no matter what I did and obtained, I was never satisfied because my intention was wicked. It was all about me. It was all about pride. You got to die to yourself and you got to go. You got to know that Jesus Christ is the truth. And that's where your life begins. And I'm telling you, it's going to be a fun life. It's going to be a fun life. I wish I, I'm talking to the younger me, like when you get to like 40 something, you're going to live the life that at the end of the thirties that you've always wanted only to realize you wasted so much. So don't waste nothing, man. Say yes to Jesus right now. And he's going to give you a peace that surpasses all natural understanding. He's going to fulfill you. And that not only does he fill you, he fills you up until you overflow. So then the people around you, they're going to get splashed. They're going to get the overflow of the joy and the peace that you have. Little man. So get your mind right, little <laughs> dude. You know what I mean? Pick your pants up, boy. You look like a clown. Give me that rag. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> uh, Andy, thank you so much, man. This is an absolute pleasure. I love your energy. Um, thank you. You know, I, hope and, I really hope this opens up some more doors for you and, you know, keep preaching your testimony and, Amen. you know, just... Thank you again, man. I'm Thank glad we you. made this connection. If you need anything, you know, we're here for you. Praise God. Let me tell you one more thing. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is another thing that, I, that, I'm, that I'm in the process of, and it's, it's, it's cool, too. So I want to do a rehabilitation discipleship program like the one I was sentenced to. So I, I purchased these containers. Like we, I got a church that sits on 1.4 acres. So in the back, I purchased these two containers that I'm renovating to where I can disciple men, house them there, teach them a trade. Not just the word. Like, I'm going to give them the word, but I want to give them a skill, too. So when they get out, they could just start all the way over and have an upper hand. But this is this is cool. So the same division that I was facing the temp murder in, 
I end up going for do because I work with a lot of programs. Like I send a lot of people to different discipleship rehabilitation programs, right? So I'm I'm over there advocating for this guy, trying to get him in this program that I'm connected with in Indiana, Victory, Victory R, Vincennes, and Washington. So I'm there. And then I'm trying to call my lawyer because I'm like, it's not looking good for the dude. And I'm like, I'm trying to like, can I approach the bench? Like, you know <laughs> what I'm saying? So then uh, he ain't answer. And like a boldness came upon me. Now, look, you know, I'm a three time felon, right? I raised my hand. I'm like, your honor. She's like, yes, sir, reverend. I said, may I approach the bench? <laughs> like, it's how you see on TV. She said, yes, sir. I approached the bench and then I'm talking her language because I, I said, look, this is a nice third felony conviction. He's eligible for a suspended sentence with the requirement he completes a one year in-house treatment program if the DA is in compliance. Y'all can mandate him to this program under a suspended sentence. You know, so she's so impressed. They sentence him to the program. And then she says, look, Reverend. Whenever you open your program up, let me know, get the bulletin to my clerk, and I'm going to sentence people to your program before they go to DOC as a last chance. I'm like, this is crazy. You know, the same division that I could have lost me now, I got favor with. So we in the process of that. You know, we hit the first phase. You know, it's just like, you know, just we waiting for the funds to come into where we could finish doing the whole thing. And then we're going to be doing the same thing like that that I was able to do. We're going to be able to do it to others. That's incredible, man. Yeah. Well, I wish you the best of luck with thank that. Thank you, brother. And Amen. good luck with everything this and weekend. Man, thank you for having me, brother. Of course, this, this man. Cool. It was a pleasure, man. All right. <laughs>